Let's begin by telling you that the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission has announced significant progress in its ongoing investigation into the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs scandal with fresh recoveries totaling $445,000 and 3 billion naira. According to EFCC spokesman Dele Oyewale, these latest recoveries were made between March and April, building up to upon the 30 billion naira previously recovered before March, as referenced by EFCC chairman Olu Olukoyede in a recent interview. The probe was initiated by the directive of President Bola Tinubu following the suspension of the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Dr. Beta Edu. Also under scrutiny are Edu's predecessor, Sadia Umar Farouk, and the coordinator of the National Social Insurance Programs Agency, Halima Shehu. Oyewale noted that the EFCC remains committed to uncovering any instances of financial impropriety and ensuring accountability within government agencies as investigations continue. Away from that, organized labor has outlined its expectations with a key demand for the federal government to unveil a new minimum wage as Nigeria prepares to celebrate Walker's Day on May 1st. In an interview, Tommy Etim, National Vice President of the Trade Union Congress, underscored the pressing need for a revised minimum wage, citing concerns over the impact of government policies that have worsened poverty levels among Nigerians. Etim emphasized that the welfare of workers must be prioritized, urging the government to consider their plight seriously. He noted that labor leaders anticipate the rollout of various incentives to alleviate the financial strain caused by government policies that have eroded the purchasing power of workers and citizens alike. Now, heightened security measures are in place across southwest Nigerian states in response to recent events as authorities have bolstered security around key government installations aiming to prevent any attempts to disrupt law and order by groups pushing their agendas. Security agencies have seized or issued stern warnings emphasizing their resolve to clamp down on any form of insecurity. They caution individuals claiming affiliation with the Yoruba nation's agitation to choose the path of peace or face the consequences. This announcement comes after an alarming incident on Saturday where separatist Yoruba nation agitators made an audacious attempt to seize the Oyo State Government Secretariat in Ibadan. Reports indicate that the agitators, dressed in army camouflage and armed with rifles, sought to raise their flag at the Oyo State House of Assembly premises. However, swift action by security agencies led to the arrest of 20 individuals involved in the attempt. To discuss this further, I'm joined by Global President, Yoruba Council Worldwide, Oladotun Hassan. Hello, Oladotun. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. I got the program. All right, so Oladotun, what are the legal charges that the arrested Yoruba nation agitators might face for the attempt on the Oyo State Government Secretariat? Well, the, the act of the, uh, the, I was call them the drug to the element under the guise of this Yoruba nation agitators uh, is highly condemnable, is illegal, and is questionable felony uh, against the state. Uh, the entire Yoruba, I speak for the entire Yoruba land. The entire Yoruba land is not in any way endorsing anything called Yoruba nation agitation. Uh, we are for true federalism as far as the Republic of Nigeria is concerned. Our opinions are geared towards developing our democracy. And what just transpired is just a lack of uh, knowledge, uh, ineptitude, and um, laziness in thinking of some persons. Uh, led by one uh, only theory as uh, Abiola and some other person, characters, mm -hmm. who just believe that uh, via social media, they can take over and declare a state, which is very wrong. There are processes. Hello? Ola Dotson, can you hear me?
Hello, Ladotun. All right, we seem to be having connection issues uh, with Ola Dotun, but uh, hello, can you hear me, Ola Dotun? I can hear you. All right, please go ahead. Yes, it is highly illegal and uh, I did it um, uh, on court for. And I, as I speak to you of any urban nation agitation, whoever that is doing that is self serving. Uh, we are aware one Abiola Onisiri is been declaring on social media that uh, there is a country called Yoruba Nation. We are all Yoruba. We all believe in uh, Yoruba ness and our Mwaluabi character. And in Yoruba land, we don't take decisions in this uh, uh, disgruntled uh, uh, manner. And it's highly uncalled for. And as I speak as the president of Yoruba Council worldwide, all of us are not in support of this uh, ridiculous act. Uh, it's so embarrassing and uh, inimical to call this that uh, these people are from Europe. I believe they might be sponsored again to disrupt the uh, democratic process. We call on Nigerian police. Uh, 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 all right, and all right, Ola Dotun. Now, talking about democratic processes, how does the right to peaceful assembly differ from actions that could be construed as public disorder? Well, uh, peaceful assembly has fundamental rights as enshrined in the, in the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. It is entrenched in the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights and African Charter of Human Rights. These are global inherent rights of inalienable rights of every man to assemble peacefully and to agitate for whatever that pleases them. But when it becomes a lawful assembly, is the carrying of arms, invasion, and seizing a government asset. That means that is unlawful, that is threatening violent conduct, that is conduct that is capable of breach of peace. And these are crimes that are, that are punishable under the ACDL. And these are crimes that the country, in front of So as the president of the council and as a lawyer, I believe this is highly uncalled for. And this is to, to call all these agitators to order including um, uh, uh, Tristan De Gomu, uh, Professor Baji Akitoe, that is, there is high time they put outside the box and resolve on developing the land on a peaceful model. Not this chance of war, chance of uh, declaration here and there. Yoruba nations are not gotten on this premise of, uh, of, root, of rootless process. Whatever is going to be in that regard, People need to sit down. See, there must be a referendum. There must be there must be plebiscite. These are not just group of people sitting somewhere. And, uh, it's just like a beer panel declaration. It has nothing to do with the entire um, urbanness. And I want to implore, just as this is going, we call it call on the Biafran agitators to also see their sword. Because people like this are being sponsored by some persons outside the country or within, who making them believe that, oh, just go and declare by tomorrow, you, you know, these are misleading uh, 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 calculated efforts, which are criminal. And that's why I'm calling that there must be proper investigation and prosecution of everyone, anyone found culpable as far as this crime is concerned. Uh, we uh, believe in Yoruba land, mm. believe in Yoruba grace, we believe in everything God has just blessed us with the president of the Republic of Nigeria. And that is the best way, the only thing we can do is to ensure that while we are sitting as president, we caution our own son, we guide him very well not to, to ensure proper delivery of dividend of democracy. It's been distributed uh, yeah, equitably to all uh, Nigeria. Uh, all right, uh, Ola Dotun, now as a lawyer yes. and in your you know, uh, expert's opinion, uh, are there any legal frameworks within Nigeria for a region to pursue secession peacefully? Well, there is no provision as far as the country's constitution is concerned, especially I'm an agitator for a new people's constitution, a constitution that breeds not the, 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 uh, the, the military equipment for the 1999 constitution, but a constitution that, that recognizes the indigenous rights of the people and identity. These are critical areas that must be considered. Even in UK, it recognizes the, the citizens' value. But as far as this constitution is concerned, in its own litmus way, 
it's not enough to to solve the entire Nigeria mass of problems. And that's why a lot of agitation has been on for restructuring. And this is not restricted to Yoruba thinking alone. You know. This is a national call. And we have had a uh, national call far before now. We have had a lot of uh, conversations on this policy. These are the dated opinions that we want the, the, the government of the day to sit over and converse with the people. There must be conversation. But as far as the constitution of the land is concerned, there is no provision for such. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Oladotun Hassan, for joining me and speaking on this. All right. In the meantime, fresh crisis seems to be brewing in Delta communities over disputed parcel of land between Afisere and Ogbowan communities, both in Ugeli North, local government area of Delta, South South Nigeria. This is coming barely a few months after some communities within the state couldn't resolve their differences that led to the loss of lives and property. News Central correspondent Austin Azu completes the report. Ogbowa and Afisere communities are both of Ugele Kingdom in Delta State. Both communities are said to have good records of cordial relationship over the years, especially when attributed to their intermarriages, commerce, culture and traditions. Leaders of Ogbonwa community have converged on this hall to address the recent developments in their area. They accused a neighboring officiary community of erecting two signposts at the center of their community within scriptures as welcome to officiary extension, goodbye from officiary extension. It is indeed not only worrisome but also highly provocative that the officiary use pull down the signboard of Ogbonwa Secondary School and in its place erected their second signboard. However, by the special grace of God, Ogbonwa youths who were visibly angry were restrained by elders of Ogbonwa community from confronting the officer youths while in the process of erecting the signboards. All efforts made by the elders of Ogbonwa community to resolve the issue through dialogue with Afisere people have so far proved abortive. Meanwhile, Afisere community leaders we'll have revealed that the people of Ogbonwa are customary tenants in their community as they denied having any land disputes with her neighbor, Ogbonwa. The, the ancestral home of the Ogbonwa community is located between two to three kilometers from the present day Ogbonwa community. The pertinent question is that is it wrong that the community secured their land by erecting a signpost of their land? To advert another land dispute related crisis in Delta State, it is expected that the state government would activate all mechanisms to urgently intervene in the pending crisis between both communities. In Ugele, Delta State, for News Central, I'm Austin Azu. News Central now returns after the break. Stay with us.
Members of the Chibok community in Borno State, northeastern Nigeria, have called for the return of all rescued Chibok schoolgirls still in custody of the state government to their families. They accused the Borno State government of keeping the girls with repentant Boko Haram members and denying their families access to them. Idong Joseph reports. It's exactly 10 years since the sad and unfortunate kidnap of over 276 secondary school girls from Chibok in Borono State, northeast Nigeria. While about 194 girls have so far been rescued, with 82 still remaining in captivity, members of the Kibako community have expressed disappointment over government's inability to effect their rescue. Within this time, 48 parents have lost their lives, mostly due to heart conditions and other health-related reasons. Three parents have been killed in subsequent Boko Haram attacks in Chiwok and have been victims of vitriolic campaigns aimed at dissuading us from pursuing the cause of our daughters Many families from the community say they are yet to find closure and want the government to come out clean on those who they say they have information that have died in captivity. As witnessed and established by their classmates and friends while in captivity. There's no dodging the bullet here. Two of the parents have since gotten the news of the passing of their daughters. They accused the Borono state government of rehabilitating the rescued girls with the Boko Haram terrorists, urging them to reunite the girls with their families. They also called for the 2014 General Sabo Fact-Finding Committee report on the Chibok incident to be made public. We demand a formal rebuttal and apology to all the families and the community at large for the illegal cohabitation encouraged by the Borno State government by calling the terrorists their husbands, immediately publish and disclose the facts and findings all investigation panel reports that have been carried out on the abduction of our Chibo girls. Community members here have accused the government of keeping the community under siege on the pretext of ensuring adequate security. And they say security operatives have continuously denied the public access to the community, a situation they find discomforting. In Abuja for New Central, I am Idonk Joseph. Thank you, Idonk, for that report. Now, between the 2014 abduction of students in Chipwalk and now, there has been over a dozen attacks on schools where students and teachers were either kidnapped or killed. This next report by News Central's Uzonna Onoye helps us better understand how unsafe schools have become in the last 10 years. His report. The report by the Save the Children initiative says that about 1,700 school children have been kidnapped within the last 10 years. About 180 children and 14 school staff also lost their lives in the attacks within the same period. Let's just try to help you make better sense of all of this. There have been several, but we'll pick a few to understand. And first, we begin with Government Girls Secondary School in Chibok, Boronu State, the incident took place on April 14, exactly 10 years today, and it took it led to the kidnap of 270 plus schoolgirls. This triggered um, widespread outrage, leading to the Bring Back Our Girls campaign. Foreign and local forces lashed out on the incident, and you know, on the government of the day, led by President Goodluck Jonathan, and government began to react two weeks after silence, two weeks after of keeping quiet and perhaps not sure of what really happened. Many were freed several years, but we understand that some dozens, as a matter of fact, are still in captivity. It didn't end there. We went ahead to see again from Government Girls Science and Technical College, Yobe State, on February 19, 2018, where 110 school girls were kidnapped. Five of them died on the day of the abduction and 104 of them were released on March 2018. One of them, Leah Sharibu, everyone will remember, is still in captivity. The next incident we are monitoring 
took place at the Government Science Secondary School in Kankara, Zamfara State on December 11, 2020, where about 300 students were abducted. The governor of the state then um, said that the BAT Allah was responsible for securing their release. That's quite interesting. And then we move to the next incident we are tracking from Government Science College, Kagara, Niger State, February 17, 2021. 27 students were abducted from their school. One died in the gunfire that led to the abduction. Three staff of the school and 12 of their family members were also taken. 42 of them were freed 10 days after from captivity. And then the next we are looking at is at Government Girls Secondary School, Jangebe, Zamfara State, on February 26, 2021. 317 students were abducted from their school in one night, and the so called bandits were held responsible. And for a state government, shot all boarding schools in reaction. The hostages were released a few days after on March the 2nd, 2021. Next school we are looking at is Salihu Tanko Islamic School in Niger State on May 30, 2021. 150 students were kidnapped from this school in one operation. One of them who was shot in the process later died. 88 days after being with the abductors, these children were freed. And then the next school we are looking at, which appears to be the most recent, is LEA Primary and Junior High School, where about 300 pupils and students and teachers also were abducted in the morning. And so-called bandits, again, were held responsible. Then the interesting thing is that 137 of them were freed after, which created a kind of confusion on what exact number that were kidnapped in the first instance. However, what is most important is that they are free. A teacher unfortunately died in the hands of the abductors. The children were later reunited with their families three days after in Kaduna. But also remember, they were kidnapped in Kaduna but released in Zamfara State. If you connect these dots, you will understand what is, how serious the situation had been. There are several of these incidents, several of them, but we chose to look at these few to broaden our thoughts and make us better understand the magnitude of the situation we have in our hands. Successive governments have made different shades of promises to protect schools and end insurgency in Nigeria. These 10 years and the records of incidents with, on the table that we all can see within the period may just be a measurement of the sincerity or lack of it from the authorities in keeping these promises. That was a detailed report uh, by Uzona. Thank you so much for that. Now let's also tell you that having more children that the family income can comfortably take care of has been blamed for the cycle of poverty in many African societies, including Nigeria. To embrace family planning as a way of achieving poverty eradication and promoting the health of women, health experts say the factors that mitigate against family planning must be dismantled through more sensitization. News Central's Omolola Ololade in this report explored some of the myths and misconceptions hindering the upscale of family planning in Nigeria. With a population of approximately 200 million, an annual population growth rate of 3.2% and a total fertility rate of 5.2%, Nigeria is set to double its population in 10 years, if nothing is done to reverse the demographic momentum, according to statistics. Despite being the most populous on the continent, the country has a contraceptive prevalence rate of only 12%. The unmet need for family planning in Nigeria is estimated to be at 48% among sexually active unmarried women and 19% among currently married women, according to UNICEF. These therefore reflect the attitude of Nigerians towards family planning. 
Well, I think the major risk behind family planning is the aspect of procedure. That's if you don't meet the right person. You know, some people in the quest to do family planning could end up meeting people that are not specialists. And before you know it, they end up risking their lives and their um, fertility status. They, the reason why they actually went into it is because they were trying to prevent pregnancy. But at some point when they now needed the pregnancy, they started having little complications. Sometimes maybe removing it, even after removal, it's now difficult for them to conceive. Many women and many families give birth, call it unwanted children. But no, no any children that is unwanted. It is back due to lack of knowledge of family planning. That is why they continue to give births. Despite the advocacy and interventions by the government and non-governmental organizations, disproportionate perceptions, ideations, cultural beliefs and myths have remained major barriers against family planning in most African countries, including Nigeria. While family planning remains one of the key pillars of safe motherhood, many uninformed people perceive it as a decoy to depopulate Africa, hence the need for more sensitization. Instead of coming to the facility where they will cancel you and then make a choice, what I mean by cancelling, I mean giving you the opportunity to make it an informed choice of the different available uh, contraceptives for you to uptake. People continue to feed uh, wrong information to our sisters, uh, aunties, mothers, and all that, and then they refuse. And the next thing is they will be having unplanned pregnancies. We have people say that um, family planning, it's a way to control the population, that it's a um, white world agenda to, yeah. to reduce the Afri yeah. African population. Um, so um, a lot um, ha needs to go into um, family planning education, even though it seems that within the urban, we all know about family planning, but within the communities, a lot of um, advocacies, a lot of social behavioral change communication needs to happen. For family planning to move forward in Nigeria, experts believe a joint effort is needed with the government taking a leadership role in promoting the use of family planning and ensuring the relevant stakeholders take individual responsibilities seriously. In Lagos, for News Central, Omolola Ololade. Amnesty International has joined the chorus of voices urging Nigeria's government to intervene in Shell's proposed sale of its onshore oil business, citing concerns over human rights in the Niger Delta. Now, according to the human rights charity, the scale could worsen ongoing human rights abuses in the region if the environmental damage caused by Shell's operations is not addressed. Amnesty International insists that Shell must allocate sufficient funds to remediate the environmental harm it has caused and that local communities in the Niger Delta must be consulted about the sale, which is valued at over $2.4 billion. Activists have long accused Shell of negligence, attributing frequent oil leaks in the Niger Delta to the company's practices, which have led to contamination of groundwater sources and other environmental issues. Welcome back. Tensions escalate in Kenya as civil and human rights groups demand an apology from the country's police chief over his controversial remarks targeting striking health workers. Now, the Kenyan Medical Practitioners, Pharmacist and Dentist Union, KMPDU, initiated a strike on March 14th, citing grievances including unpaid salary arrears and delays in deploying medical interns. However, Inspector General of Police Jafet Kome sparked outrage when he labeled the striking health workers as a public nuisance for obstructing roads and causing disruptions during demonstrations. Kome further warned of potential security threats from non-medical individuals joining the protest, instructing the police to handle such situations firmly. In response, KMPDU and eight civil and human rights organizations have demanded a retraction and apology from Kume, threatening legal action of their demands are not met. 
The transitional president in charge, General Mohamed Idris Debi Idno, has launched his campaign for the upcoming presidential election in May, a contest he is expected to dominate with his main rival sidelined from the race. Now at just 40 years old, General Idno ascended to power after a junta of 15 generals declared him president following the death of his father, Idris Debi Itno, who had held sway over Chad for over three decades. Initially, General Itno pledged to return power to civilian rule within 18 months and vowed not to run for president. But however, he later extended the transition period by two years and announced his candidacy for the presidency in March. The Israel War Cabinet is said to be in agreement that a response is required to the Iran attack, although members remain divided over a time frame. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden has warned Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that the U.S. will not take part in a counteroffensive against Iran, an option Netanyahu's War Cabinet favors after a mass drone and missile attack on Israel, or Israeli territory over the weekend. Now, according to analysts, the threat opens warfare erupting between the arch Middle East foes and dragging in the United States put the region on edge, triggering calls for restraint from global powers and Arab nations. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres told a Security Council that the Middle East is on the brink as the people of the region are confronting a real danger of a devastating full-scale conflict. He called on those responsible to defuse and de-escalate the situation. Now to discuss this, I'm joined by former Israel Defense Forces security personnel, Sarid Zahavi. Hello, Sarid. Thank you so much for joining me at this time. Thank you. Thank you All for right, having so, me. Yeah. So what are your insights on the recent escalation between Israel and Iran, and how do you perceive this impacting peace and security in the Middle East? Peace and security uh, never seem far away than today. Uh, I'm sorry to say, but uh, what happened in the past few days just proved the Iranian plan in advance, which is creating a situation of unification of fronts against Israel and Western presence in the region. Iran uh, had used its uh, proxies uh, to create a multi-front attack against Israel with drones, uh, ballistic missiles, and cruise missiles. The good news is that it seems like uh, not only the countries in the region, like Jordan and Saudi Arabia and other Gulf countries, but also Western countries like uh, Britain and France and United States understood the threat we are facing and were willing to help us defend ourselves, which, which is definitely not obvious and very, very important with regard to the message that is being sent uh, to Iran itself. Iran posed a global threat. We were all united to defend the state of Israel against this threat, but defense is not a strategy uh, to solve the problem and to bring uh, peace and security, because as we speak, uh, we are still under attack in the northern front here. I can say that uh, I live up, up north. Uh, my Alma Center that I established is based 12 kilometers from the Lebanese border. And we had uh, around mo more than 1,400 attacks since October 8, since the Northern Front was open against the state of Israel. And that's why there was the killing in uh, Damascus of the Iranian general a few weeks ago. He was the commander of the Northern Front here. Okay. Uh, I think that it's very important that uh, globally, Iran will also see an offensive effort against it meaning that the world will send a clear message that it cannot accept the ballistic missiles problem, it cannot accept the nuclear uh, program, it cannot accept the cultivation of proxy militias in the Middle East that are actually uh, collapsing the nearby states over here, whether it's Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. All of this should be terminated, and this is the opportunity to unite around this cause. All right, Sarid, now you talked about, you know, uh, Israel being under attack on almost all fronts. And I uh, would actually love to know, as a former Israeli Defense Force security personnel, in your experience, 
how do you think regional dynamics and geopolitical interests play a role, especially in fueling conflicts in the Middle East, particularly between Israel and Iran? Look, the Middle East changed deeply in the past decade. Uh, it's not the Middle East that we used to know, and it, it took us a while to understand that. Iran invested a lot of efforts in taking advantage of the civil wars in Syria and in, in Iraq, and also of the very fragile situation in Lebanon, to establish proxy militias that are posing a threat to the state of Israel. Hezbollah in Lebanon is the most professional one, uh, and it's actually trained all other militias, oh, and also Yemen, which I almost forgot. And uh, today what we see is that these proxy militias have capabilities that uh, we couldn't imagine a decade ago. If this will not be stopped, these proxy militias will pose a threat to us, which is uh, very similar to what we've seen in the past weekend, but uh, except they are closer. And the closer you get to the borders of Israel, the easier for you is to avoid the aerial defense systems. And that's why when missiles are launched from Lebanon or, or UAVs are launched from Lebanon, the, le the percentage of success with intercepting is different. It's not 99% like what we experienced in the past weekend. All relationships yeah. here are, are, are changing. And as I've said, I think that the good news uh, around everything that is happening is that the uh, Sunni countries in the region, which is Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, and Arab Gulf, all of them today are willing to strengthen their relationship with Israel and um, uh, participated, most of them participated actively in uh, this uh, uh, defense uh, activity that we were witnessing in the past uh, weekend. This proves that if we want to, we can work together, Israelis and Arabs, against uh, a threat over here in the Middle East, of course, with the mediation and assistance of the United States and others. All right, uh, Sarit, you talked about working together, that's Israeli and Arabs. You also talked about, you know, proxy militians, militias, you know, having capabilities that uh, you didn't even know about and, you know, uh, the need to actually stop them. But what measures do you believe could be taken to, you know, stop them and to mitigate the risks of any further escalation? Look, I think that what Israelis learned from October 7th is that we cannot continue to believe that our enemies are deterred while they are uh, building their capabilities to the next war. If a, a player here is deterred or interested in having peace and security for its people, it is not investing in offensive capabilities, it is investing more, investing more in a defensive. And it is not talking day and night on the termination of the State of Israel, which this is what it is being done by Iran, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, and, 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 sorry, and others. I can tell you that the chance of death to Israel, death to America, a curse upon the Jews. Uh, we hear them from Sana to Beirut and to South Lebanon, uh, to Iraq and, and to Damascus. These chants are being heard by the proxy militias of Iran all over the Middle East, and this should be changed. Now, if you talk about how, do, how should we change that, of course it should be a combination of a diplomatic effort with military activity. If we only take diplomatic effort been there, done that. 17 years ago, we had uh, Resolution 1701 with regard to Lebanon, which was supposed to create a new order uh, over here next to the Lebanese-Israeli border, and it didn't happen. Hezbollah never had any intention to, to respect uh, this resolution. So uh, it should be a combination of on both. These proxy militias don't truly care about their own people. They cherish death and they culture uh, the, the culture of death, and that's why it's so uh, difficult to uh, to those who cherish life to create deterrence or to actually uh, diplomatically solve the problem. But right. a combination of both could be very effective if it's sanctions, if it's UN Security Council resolution, and if it's military activity that is combined not only by the Israelis, especially when we speak about uh, the possibility of nuclear program of Iran. This shouldn't be held only by Israel. The threat is a global threat. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sarit uh, Zahavi, for joining me and speaking on this. Thank you for having me.
Now away from that, hundreds of abortion rights supporters have gathered outside Phoenix, Arizona, days after the southwestern United States Conservative Supreme Court rolled back reproductive rights to the Civil War era, saying an 1864 ban on abortion was valid. Now the spokesperson for the Arizona for Abortion Access Campaign and the rally's organizer Chris Love says many are saddened by this move. The one protection put in place to allow an abortion is if the mother's life is at risk. We are now, sadly, under an 1864 law, a law that was in existence when, when Abraham Lincoln was the president, when women didn't have a right to vote, when women couldn't own property. So this right here is the mobilization of folks who are sick and tired of the MAGA Republicans telling women what they should do. Um, I feel really heartened, actually, about the support that we're receiving from Arizonans today for our initiative. Um, you know, I think folks are mad as hell about what happened on Tuesday. And, you know, they're using that anger and turning it into something that's really beautiful out here. And I think it's important for the nation to see that Arizonans will fight like hell to restore and protect our right to abortion. I do think we have to stand together against the government when they try to make decisions that affect us all. There's definitely a lot of bigger problems in the world than deciding on women's bodies. Mexico's local public security secretary, Pablo Vazquez, says three people died after a helicopter crash this Sunday south of Mexico City. The official added that the collapse occurred in the district of Coyoacan and that neither the population nor the homes surrounding the accident were at risk. Earlier, the mayor of the capital, Marti Betres, said that the helicopter fell on Aztecas and Deliman Avenues and that emergency services were heading to the point of the accident. The local prosecutor's office said on the same social network that it began an investigation into the helicopter crash. Let's now join our business desk for the news. Hello and welcome to Business News. Analysts expect oil prices to rise on Monday after Iran's attack on Israel over the weekend. However, further gains may depend on how Israel and the West retaliate. Concern of a response from Iran to the strike on its embassy compound in Damascus supported oil last week and helped send global benchmark Brent crude on Friday to $92.18 per barrel, the highest since October. It settled that day up 71 cents at $90.45, while U.S. West Texas Intermediate crude futures rose 64 cents to at $5.66. Iran has steeply raised oil exports, its main source of revenue under the Joe Biden administration. The World Bank Group has credited interest rate increases by the Central Bank of Kenya and a partial settlement of Kenya's debut eurobond for the shillings rally seen since mid-February. According to the multinational lender, the higher benchmark lending rate by the CBK has amounted to a defense of the local currency, while the partial repayment of the eurobond notes maturing in June has revived demand for the shilling. The shilling has been the biggest gainer among currencies in sub-Saharan Africa on a year-to-date basis, alongside the Zambian Kwacha, which has shared some of its gains. CBK undertook two consecutive raises of the benchmark interest rate in December and February, setting the central bank rate at 13% from 10.5%, with the primary goal of cushioning the shilling by attracting foreign exchange flows into local investments such as government securities. And finally, Somalia is banking on new opportunities coming out of recent debt relief to seek new credit lines and open for trade. Despite security challenges and ongoing state rebuilding, Somalia's ambassador to Kenya, Jabril Ibrahim Abdul, says Somalia is yearning to play a big role in the region and the international stage. In December, Somalia reached an agreement to cancel $4.5 billion of debt with international lenders. That, the diplomat says, gave it new opportunity to attract investors as well as be eligible to borrow more from lenders. So far, Mogadishu has been cautious of simply piling new debt, and officials have said they will prioritize opening up and rebuilding state institutions instead. It's a wrap on Business News at this hour. Thank you for watching. I am Perpetra Fasame Peter. The news continues shortly. Bye for now.
Now in the world of sports, Ashton Villa dealt a major blow to Arsenal's hopes of securing their first Premier League title in 20 years as late goals from Leon Bailey and Ollie Watkins earned the Vistas a 2-0 victory at the Emirates Stadium. Earlier in the day, Liverpool suffered a shocking 1-0 home defeat against Crystal Palace with Eberechi Eze converting from Tyrick Mitchell's cutback to finish off a flowing move early on. Now, the visitors uh, deserved their lead at the break as Jürgen Klopp's Reds struggled to find their usual fluency. Despite ramping up the pressure in the second half, Liverpool's finishing let them down once again, similar to recent games against Manchester United and Atalanta, resulting in their first league loss at home since October 2022. Manchester City now sits at the top of the table with 73 points with six games left to play. And that's all at this hour. But before we go, here's another look at some of our top stories. We told you that security has been beefed up in Southwest government houses following Yoruba Nation agitation. We also told you that human rights groups have demanded apology from Kenyan police chief. You also heard that Junta chief has launched presidential campaign. Send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen. Do follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. You can watch New Central live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times channel 274, Abo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I'm Darshan Usman.